Um, well, we have all of these super cool people coming together to model and display all of these outfits that we've put together. Um, and it's just looking around here, it's really cool to see how everyone has uh, put together and stitched together these really cool outfits out of uh, their different materials. Well, my sister actually started it, and I just I thought it was really cool, and I was really interested in the topic, so I decided that I was also going to model. And are you, are you modeling and doing clothes? Um, no, I just model. And uh, so who made this dress? Um, I'm actually part of the second-hand catwalk, so this is my mom's old dress. Very pretty. So, so you're, you're, so you're being sustainable by wearing uh, old clothes. Yeah, instead of throwing them away, repurposing them. So tell me about how you got involved in this project. Um, so my cousin dragged me into this. I go to Noon South. Uh, my cousin goes to Wellesley, and she knows the person who organized this, so I kind of got wrapped in like that. So this is a very cool outfit you're wearing, and did you design it? Um, yeah, like, what's the definition of design here? I don't know. <laughs> okay, so, like, I did throw it together, yes. Well, did you add stuff to an old jacket, or? Uh... Uh, yeah, so I already had this jacket beforehand. I added these feathers. I thrifted the shirt mm -hmm. and kind of cut out, like, the skeletal thing. Like, I'm going for kind of a dead albatross kind of vibe, since mm -hmm. my cousin runs the... Um, environmental Action Club, so we're kind of doing stuff about pollution. Okay, what's the, what's the, what is the mask? Um, albatross head. Okay. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> All right, it goes, kind of goes with the feather. Yeah. Okay, you can pass the mic on. All right, cool. All right. And what's your name? I'm Susanna. Uh, Susanna, um, tell me about uh, your involvement in, the, in this show tonight. Yeah, so I know Sophia, so she's one of the organizers we met at Fridays for Future, which meets on Fridays outside Wellesley Town Hall. Um, and I, we've been talking about it since like last September. And tell me about your outfit. Yeah, so um, with my cousin doing the dead albatross look, and then one of the members of Enact doing an ocean um, statement piece, I kind of wanted to go with like ocean goddess vibes, I guess is the best way to describe it. Um, so this is a bed sheet, and then these are uh, like window curtains, um, and then I found these necklaces at a thrift shop. Yeah. It was kind of seafoam. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. Okay, very good. Pass the mic on. Right. What's your name? Hi, I'm Iris. Uh, Iris, uh, so tell me about your, what's your involvement in, in the show tonight. Um, I'm a member of an act, and I'm also modeling for our like club's collaborative piece. Mm -hmm. So I'm the model that Susanna was mentioning. Uh, this is the ocean statement piece. Um, we have the behind okay. angle is the best one. Um, it has found trash. Uh, stapled and sewed to it, um, and the it's like a blue um, tablecloth that we recycled to represent the ocean. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and we also made the skirt that I'm wearing as a club. Very nice. I love the leaves. Thank you. Yeah. And so, uh, are you are you uh, going to be doing more fashion in the future? Uh, probably. I sew some of my own clothes just mm -hmm. for fun. So, probably some so of that. Skilled. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. That harm the environment. The mass production of cheap clothing encourages consumers to buy and discard them easily, which further contributes to environmental pollution, and so the self-perpetuating cycle continues. Clearly, this is a serious environmental justice issue. However, I don't believe it's being taken seriously enough. Back in the fall of 2021, I wanted to write an article for a local magazine about the impacts of fast fashion on the environment and garment workers. When I pitched my idea, the editors turned down the article unless I made it less upsetting to readers. They felt that the truth of this matter would be too much for readers to handle and suggested I write about a more positive subject regarding sustainability. I was taken aback and quite frustrated, honestly, by the feedback I was receiving. The truth should never be silenced just because it makes people upset. The topic of fast fashion affects our planet and so many innocent people, and if we do not spread awareness about it, how is anything ever going to change? So back in October last year, I decided that if this magazine wouldn't let me spread awareness about fast fashion, 
I was going to organize an event that would educate our community, and this is where this evening's Future of Fashion was born. I chose to host this event specifically this week because it is International Fashion Revolution Week. This week in April commemorates the lives of innocent individuals lost to the fashion industry and aims to raise awareness of the industry's unsustainable practices. During this week, we demand that no one should die for fashion. As I came up with the event, my goals were to number one, raise awareness about sustainable and ethical fashion, number two, encourage people in the community to reduce their fast fashion consumption by providing them with sustainable alternatives, number three, raise money for Fashion Revolution, a nonprofit dedicating to improving the fashion industry, both sustainably and ethically. Later on in the show, you will learn more about this, but at this point, I'd like to add that we have already raised over $1,000 for this cause. And finally, and most importantly, number four, I wanted to engage people from different parts of the community to help put the show together, because at the end of the day, we cannot solve any climate change issues without community involvement. It takes all of us together to make a change. So tonight, you will see the many community members who have given their time and effort to help put the show together. The outfits in the fashion show are all sustainably and ethically made and are created and modeled by students from Dana Hall, Wellesley College, Babson College, and some other local schools. These artists have put in a tremendous amount of work in creating and modeling their pieces. As I mentioned earlier, this is not just a fashion show, but also an educa educational event. The Fashion Show Committee, which includes Aimo Gong, Cassie Churchill, Anna Steiger, Cece Wang, Inye Atiga, and Annie Stewart, have all helped so much with organizing, publicizing, and raising money for Fashion Revolution. I am indebted to their support, and this event simply could not have happened without them. Tonight, you will hear speeches on different topics relating to fashion from many of the committee members. You will also hear some amazing speeches from two sustainable artists and an eco-conscious business owner. We were also going to have a speech from a local Wellesley College thrift store owner, but unfortunately she could not make it last minute. This event was created by the community for the community. Thank you for your time, and let's enjoy the show. and I am the fashion show director. And the first catwalk of this show is a collection by the students of the Exploring Design class. The Exploring Design class is a course for students to learn the fundamentals of design and how they relate to problem solving in graphic design, advertising, fashion design, and computer graphics. Students explore the principles of design and visual elements in their projects using hands-on materials and computer graphics. They also work on garment design, construction, and illustration. In trimester one, students constructed designs on croquis. In trimester two, students focused on publication design to create fully illustrated portfolios of their work to be professionally printed. Their creation process included four major steps. First, they chose designs and fabrics. Then the students sewed and tweaked their pieces before adding personal touches to the outfits. The students found inspiration in magazines such as Vogue and Fruits Magazine, and also on Pinterest. They consulted family and friends for opinions too. The students found sustainable materials for their pieces in the art studio bins, the sophisticated store, and on trips to Savers and other thrift stores. To make their designs come to life, the students added personal touches like rips, paint, patches, and zippers to give the designs something special. Thank you, and now let's enjoy the products of the Exploring Designs class. Hip hop group 
uh, from the 90s, Wu Chang Clang, and also the Tribe Called Quest. Using imagery from the personal style of the group, as well as album covers, these uh, elements were able to influence this design and the next is going to be coming out now.
We have joining us two sustainable artists whose art addresses the dire climate crisis we are in. Virginia Fitzgerald is a passionate artist who is dedicated to making art that is provocative, art that makes the viewer stop and think, art that will incite people to question and to see the possibilities for themselves and the larger community. Fitzgerald's art strives to prompt a re-examination of an idea or a belief or the simple beauty of an everyday object, such as an eggshell. Fitzgerald achieves this through a multitude of media and series of work, one of these series being her dress project. Fitzgerald's dress project is a series which consists of the iconic dress form created and recreated in different media and formats. In this series, the dress form is used as a symbol for one's essential being, their core. The dress became Fitzgerald's soapbox from which she could initiate a dialogue, engage in political debate, and question social protocol. Fitzgerald's aim is to help one excavate and experience their authentic self, imagination and creativity. In her work, Fitzgerald strives to create a safe place for people to reconsider their place in the world. With the Dress Project, Fitzgerald turns a lens on the current issues being debated today. And we have also joining us Lisa Barthelson. She grew up in a family of artists and has, made, and has been making art since childhood. Her work is inspired by a reverence for the na nat natural environment and the drive for sustainability through reimagination and repurposing of the byproducts of family living excess. Barthelsen has exhibited throughout New England and New York. Her mixed media, printmaking, sculptures, and installation work have been featured in curated exhibitions of contemporary art at the Fitchburg Art Museum, the Newport Art Museum, and the Danforth Art Museum. The site-specific sculpture, Hang Lang, was purchased by the Newport Art Museum for their permanent collection. Commissions include site-specific wall sculptures from Kronos, Inc., and Worcester State University. Artists and resident fellowships have been awarded by Vermont Studio Center, BT, Player, or the Kimmel Harding Nelson Art Center, NE. The artist's current membership includes the Boston Printmakers, the Blackstone Print Studio, and associate members of the Boston Sculptors Gallery, the Monotype Guild of New England and Arts Worcester. Barthelsen works from her studio in Worcester and from her home in Rutland, Mass. These two artists are very talented, and now for a short interview, they will give us some insight into what it's like to address climate change, and specifically, the issue of the fashion industry through their art. I've been working on the Family Debris Project since I guess 2008. Um, I have three kids and as they were getting older and starting to move out of the house, I made an attempt to purge the excess stuff that we had acquired, which was really shocking to me how much we had. Um, somehow I raised my children in a different way than I had been brought up. Um, I felt like as an artist, you're always trying to purchase materials, and I had so much stuff from our post-consumer waste stream, I decided to use it as my primary art-making material. I liked the challenge, it was exciting, um, and rather than having all of this stuff end up in a landfill or incinerate it, I thought I could put it back out into the world and have a second life, and also 
you know, get people's attention about how much stuff we have and, and the threat it is to our environment. But I didn't want to beat people over the head with it. I wanted to bring them in and have them interested and excited about what's, in some cases, very playful and colorful, and hopefully have them pause to consider what the content was. Okay, so my work, and as you said, a lot of them come in a dress form. I found myself using non-traditional material, and so in that way it's sustainable. Like I have a dress that's made with plastic bottles, but it, I've been doing this for as long as I can remember. I mean, I'm also wearing bottle cap jewelry that I, I made for seven or eight years, I was making jewelry out of bottle caps, sort of before it became really popular. But um, because I find I'm intrigued not only with the recycling and having people not always buy new stuff, but I find a lot of things that we cut, cast aside are um, lovely in their looks. I mean, like a bottle cap, a lot of them might be boring, but some of them are really cool. And like I said, I made a dress out of eggshells, and that's a really interesting material um, when you stop to look at it. And ECR tape uh, is another favorite. But so my art is, you know, I guess I see potential in many things. So that would be how sustainable. <laughs> um, so I have another question. Um, I know you want to address the impacts of the fashion industry through your art. address sort of sustainable fashion in a number of ways. Um, it came up. Uh, my daughter used, <laughs> wears a lot of my old clothes. And so that means they're very old. Um, she wears a denim jacket that uh, I wore in the 70s. <laughs> she still wears. Um, she wears a North Face vest that I wore in the 80s. Yep. Yeah. And she still wears it. So we just sort of pass things along. Everything I have on today, with the exception of my pants, are well over 10 years old. So I really try to hang on to things and just wear them to death. And if they are really, you know, they have no more life in them, then they go into my artwork. Um, you'll see that I use a lot of old clothes to create soft sculptures. Uh, I made a piece, a suspending piece, of my youngest daughter's old dance costumes, if any of you dance. I'm sure you know how expensive they are and how cheesy they are. Um, so it was very, very liberating and exciting to me to, re to reuse them as an art material. Um, so I, and I actually brought, um, I, I would make a sort of a supportive statement about cert, um, finding clothes that actually address the issue of not buying into fast fashion. Uh, fast fashion. Uh, Patagonia is one of them. I have a down jacket that I ripped going under a barbed wire fence. I sent it back to them. They fixed it. They sent it back to me, giving me this really lovely note saying how much they appreciated that I had sent it to them, rather than trying to go out and buy another one. My kids have had the same experience. I've bought used clothes through Patagonia to give as gifts and people really like them. So I think you really have to uh, make careful choices when you do buy something. Um, don't buy something that's not going to last or isn't going to have a second life. Um, buy things that you can use over and over again. So that's how I sort of address the fast fashion. Well, I mean, a lot of my, a body of my work is called The Dress Project. So buy that nature, it does kind of address fashion, especially when it's made out of recycled material. But, um, or found material, this is the beginning of it. Um, and I did do a lot, I do do a lot of ephemeral work, which means that I make it and then it goes back to where, like, natural things, that, that would go back to the ocean. Um, so there's that element of my work, but also, I 
I mean, every, basically everything I have, I mean, the skirt, as we said, had a major history that I've owned, but these are from a resale shop, this is from a resale shop, so I'm a big fan of, of giving, buying again. I also, I love the idea, I think it has a story and I'm continuing the story, um, but that and also thinking about where I put my money is a big vote. So, you know, all my purchases usually have an extra slot. How, who made it, where is it going, what's it doing, and all that. So. Okay, and um, what have been the greatest challenges you've faced as sustainable artists? <laughs> I work big, um, often, and my biggest challenge is storage. Um, so one of the ways I deal with that is I will build and unbuild, construct and deconstruct. I'll use materials over and over and over again in another way. I like the challenge of seeing something have a different life in a different place using the same materials. Um, and, and for any artist, I think it's finding the time, the audience, and particularly the storage. <laughs> That's a biggie for me. Well, yeah, storage is big, especially since when you make large scale sculptures. But um, another thing is, that's why I like to do the ephemeral pieces, where I get to create it and pour everything I need to do it into it, and then, then it goes on its way. And our final question is, what is your favorite piece of sustainable fashion artwork and why? I don't know if I have a favorite sustainable fashion artwork, but sustainable work. One of the more recent ones I did called Socket to Me, where I used all of my family's single socks, damaged socks, holy socks, um, somewhere it is in there, um, to create a very large sculpture that was featured at the Danforth Art Museum. It was so satisfying. I know you all suffer from this issue of socks that don't match. Personally, I don't ever wear matching socks. I've given it up, it just isn't worth it. But it was very satisfying to really get them all together and create some kind of monstrous, both threatening and lovable piece that was very, very satisfying. And the other one was five gyres. That's not a fashion one, but I have five members in my family. There are five plastic patch gyres in the ocean. And it sort of came to me full form was using individual pieces of plastic that came out of my house that I reshaped and I created five vortexes and it hung from the ceiling of the Pittsburgh Art Museum, 23 feet of reminder of this is where the world is left right now. Thanks. Um, I don't know if I have a favorite piece of piece, but like this one gets, gets a lot of um, I did it in response to a night, uh, a scare, um, a, a, the terror scare in England that made us not be able to keep liquids on the planes. Um, so you might not even remember when that happened, it might be possible, but suddenly we weren't allowed to, um, to, to go on a plane, and I felt that was kind of wrong. And uh, so I made this, is it, is it working now? No. Yeah. Um, so I made this with the idea of about the it was a red alert because we were all red alert and that's why I used the colored liquids and the top of it is a red danger tape and I call it the red alert cocktail dress and the cool thing about this is that it can be interpreted many different ways. So a lot of people feel like it's red alert about the environment um, and in fact I was speaking last year to a uh, class from Dana Hall and some of the students were saying it, would, it seemed like it was a dress, uh, dressing, um, roofing, being roofied, and the danger of cocktail or going out drinks, which I, I blew me away. I thought that was so great. So if I had to choose one, I like this one because a lot of people can get a lot of different responses, which is what I love. I, when I do my art, I like to make it with what I'm thinking, but it's open for interpretation. Well, thank you both of you, and it's really informative and inspirational. Your art is truly beautiful.
talking about the benefits of buying secondhand clothing. Firstly, what is secondhand clothing? Secondhand clothing is reusing a piece of clothing that has been worn pre previously by someone else. Big organizations for buying secondhand include Goodwill and Savers. And it can also be pretty easy to find thrift shops within your area. So why should you buy secondhand clothes instead of getting brand new clothing? The big main answer is because it's a step in saving the environment. The volume of clothing Americans throw away each year has doubled from the last 20 years, from 7 million to 14 million tons. Textile waste can be defined as the material that becomes unusable or worthless after the end of production process of any textile product. In 2018, 7 million tons of textile waste end up, ends up in landfill. So how does the environment benefit from buying secondhand? The fast fashion industry is responsible for the huge consumption of water, energy, and natural resources. It creates large quantities of pollution, hazardous chemicals, microplastics, and greenhouse gas emissions. The fast fashion industry is responsible for 10% of worldwide carbon emissions and also emits 1.7 billion tons of carbon dioxide each year. At this rate, the greenhouse gas emissions are expected to rise by 50% by 2030. Now, when it comes to buying secondhand, these are things that you should keep in mind of while shopping. You should keep in mind of certain people's needs. You should avoid buying plus size clothing as there are limited clothing sizes for plus size people. Also, essential things like childcare items may be unaffordable for some people. Second, you should not resell items. People will resell items for a higher price in order to make profit. This raises the prices in, th in thrift stores and makes it less affordable for many who heavily rely on them for clothes. Thrifting can be a super fun activity to do with your friends, and you can find different and cool items that you wouldn't normally find in your regular clothing store. Remember that when you buy second-hand clothing, you are giving a new life to something ordinarily designed, destined for landfills. Now we are transitioning into the second-hand clothing catwalk. There was a school thrift flip event hosted where we took a trip to Savers, where we bought thrifted items and created outfits with them. Individuals in the middle and upper school from Dana Hall are going to the modeling outfits they created right from the closet, out outfits that are designed with secondhand fabric and from the thrift flip event. Thank you.
show so far. Um, I'm CC. I'm the fundraising director of the Future of Fashion, and I'm here to talk a little bit about fundraising. So not much surprise here, um, and also fashion revolution. So as many of you know, we are fundraising for Fashion Revolution, a UK registered charity that is dedicated to bettering the fashion industry by making it more environmentally friendly and ethical. It is actually Fashion Revolution Week uh, this week, as Sophia has mentioned, and it is also Earth Week, which is why we decided to hold our fashion show today, April 23rd, in honor of this. These are some posts from their social media, and as you can see, they do a lot of advocacy and educational work. They also perform a lot of research. You should definitely follow them to get to know some more about what they do. So we feel that their work is very important because the fashion industry is one of the main contributors to the deterioration of the environment. Here are some statistics. So the average American will throw away 37 kilograms of clothing every year. More than half of fast fashion clothing will be discarded within a year. Three out of five fast fashion items will wind up in a landfill. And less than 1% of materials for clothing production is recycled. And here's another comparison for you to get a sense of the waste that fast fashion causes. So it causes more uh, CO2 consumption than total flight and maritime transportation combined. So uh, next, all of these fast fashion brands you are familiar with are perpetrators of fast fashion, especially brands like Shein, which is soon to become a $100 billion business. Many of these companies use unethical practices, such as child labor and, uh, and very unsustainable materials. Millions of workers are forced to work in inhumane working conditions, and many garment workers have died because of this. Fashion Revolution was actually founded because of the Rana Plaza disaster in 2013 in Dhaka, Bangladesh, the clothing industry's worst ever industrial incident. Over 2,500 people were injured and 1,134 people killed. Yet, even sadder, experts have concluded the garment factory collapse was completely preventable. That is why, after that, Fashion Revolution was dedicated to advocate for a safer, sustainable fashion industry in three main ways. One, cultural change. Two, industry change. And three, policy change, which you can read more about on their website. Pictured above is one of their organized protests in Berlin. And at Dana, over the past three days, we have fundraised over $1,000, as Sylvia has said, selling handmade tote bags, bracelets, old prints and books, and more. Thank you to Cassie for making these awesome tote bags. Anna for uh, the bracelets. Ms. McQuillan is also here for offering photo prints from past Dana Hall students. Dr. Keeley for donating a huge box of books. Um, a D Dana Swag Store for Dana Swag. And the rest of the Dana Hall community for your generous de donations. Uh, after, <laughs> yeah. very successful fundraising beyond what we could have ever imagined. We have adjusted our fundraising goal actually to $2,000 and we hope you can help us achieve it. So uh, to wrap up, we would like to, you, to ask you all to donate to our GoFundMe either on our website or you can donate in cash when you walk out today. Uh, all proceeds, as uh, like I said before, will be going to Fashion Revolution. We believe that it is a collective effort to save our planet, and any amount would be greatly appreciated. I will give you all a moment to scan the QR code if you did get a chance in the beginning. Okay, and that's all for now. Uh, thank you so much, and please contact me afterwards if you have any questions, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the show. Our next speaker is Aylin, the owner of Minawa Zero Waste, a sustainable clothing and accessories brand. I actually met Aylin months ago when I was at a farmer's market in Cambridge. She was selling these really, really pretty upcycled tote bags, and my friend and I were immediately drawn to them. We both ended up buying her bags and got into a discussion with Island about the importance of sustainability in the fashion industry. 
I loved hearing her thoughts, as well as the mission of her business, and so today I've invited Ireland to share all of this with you. So please welcome her as she makes her way onto the stage. Hi everyone, uh, thank you for inviting me to this great event. Thank you for Sophia like, to make me, uh, even though I am a hidden um, small sustainable business, you, you are making me a, a known and um, to share my story with all uh, the people here. My name is Ellen. Uh, my sustainable business is uh, Ninawa Zero West Cloud. Uh, it's based on upcycling uh, unwanted um, textile material, such as uh, clothes, uh, sheet, um, uh, leftover fabric, curtain, and uh, whatever it is uh, a material. So I upcycled it into a sustainable, uh, reusable tote bag and also baby dresses. Uh, I refashion and restyle the clothes and also I do alteration. Um, since I was a kid, I had the hobby for uh, upcycling clothes and going to the thrift store. But in that time, I didn't know anything about landfill or upcycling or sustainable. And I was doing a lot of like uh, free alteration and clothes for my friend and my co-worker, but in 2019 there was a woman, she um, um, donated for me a lot of uh, vintage uh, tablecloth in good material. Um, I uh, upcycled them to 40 baby dresses and I donated them as a Christmas gift to a pregnant woman and single mother in need. Uh, when the pandemic started on 2020, uh, I made more than 400 masks and also I donate them to senior home, uh, women's shelter, and uh, a housing authority. The people... The people to whom I donate that, they advise me to start a business. I thought no one is really interested in that because in, in Boston, the, the focus is not um, in fashion and sustainable uh, material, is more like about other aspect of sustainability. Um, uh, I started um, having, uh, creating a Facebook. It was my first time being in social media. Uh, after a while, someone blocked my Facebook, um, but I didn't give up. Uh, I uh, created an Instagram. Uh, then later in November 2020, I uh, found an open market and I become a street vendor. Um, uh, I made and I sold more than uh, 400 uh, upcycled tote bags since then. <laughs> My sustainable mission is to reduce the, the waste that is sent to landfill, um, uh, replacing plastic bag with upcycled tote bag, um, helping people to uh, to uh, to go to uh, like people as uh, me uh, who do sustainable fashion to refashion their clothes, uh, their clothes, uh, restyle them, and also alteration and also offering upcycle sewing cl classes and I have been doing that all like in the street. Uh, my challenges uh, um, are uh, I do not have any brand, any funding, um, I don't have a store and even when I start my business I was living in women's shelter uh, in a small uh, place, a square of 10 feet. Um, I started there. Um, I didn't give up even though people they were telling me that, uh, my grandmother do that, there is no future for you uh, in this uh, sustainable business. Um, uh, I continue my, uh, my journey and I was very glad that my customers, they are the, the, I can say the only supporter for me, inviting me to events like this. Thank you, Sophie. Um, and also um, like helping me, I'm sorry, giving me ideas how to uh, grow my sustainable business. I'm hoping one day I will have a small factory or a small store, so um, uh, I will uh, do an event and I will invite you all. <laughs> Thank you.
Island. That was wonderful. Our next catwalk will feature models carrying Island's sustainable tote bags, so please enjoy. <laughs> look is acquired. The process of sandblasting is done manually by workers and as a result the sand often gets into these workers lungs and leads to chronic lung disease which can be severely debilitating and can shorten one's lifespan. Many companies including American Eagle and Hollister use these techniques. Another environmental impact of denim production is the use of pesticides. Is the use of pesticides. Cotton only takes up about 2.5% of agricultural land, and yet it accounts for 16% of all the insecticides and 6.8% of all herbicides used worldwide. Pesticides create toxic working environments, 
with up to 3% of agricultural workers across the world suffering from acute pesticide poisoning, with up to 1 million yearly hospitalizations. Harmful chemicals are also found in denim dyes, which can contribute to toxic environmental destruction. Pesticides also pollute soil and water sources. Speaking of water, the amount of water used to produce jeans is crazy. It takes 3,781 liters of water to produce a single pair of Levi's jeans. To put that into perspective, the average human consumes around two liters of water per day. What is notable is that the countries that manufacture the most amount of denim are often those that have a shortage of clean water. So what can you do about this? Spread information. Most people don't know about the harmful effect of denim production. When looking to buy new denim products, many companies are transparent about their policies and strive to use only recycled denim. But in general, if you can't find information about a company's ethics, they probably utilize many immoral techniques to create their products. The company Good On You is an excellent resource for looking into companies' um, practices. You can also hold companies accountable instead of shaming individual consumers because you never know the reason why people buy from fast fashion and most often it comes from a lack of resources or a lack of information. So this show aims to support the ethical production of denim along with numerous other aspects of sustainable fashion. The next catwalk you will see is a community catwalk which compromises of sustainable outfits made by the students from Wellesley College, Babson College, Wellesley Citizens, as well as the upcycled denim pieces made by Dana Hall students. Back in the winter, we hosted a denim painting event where we took jeans donate, donated to us by the community and then, you, and then used them um, to, and then painted and upcycled them to give them a new life. The event was so much fun and the catwalk, the next catwalk you will see these denim pieces. Additionally, after the show, you have the option to buy the denim pieces, with all proceeds, of course, going to Fashion Revolution. Thank you for listening, and enjoy the next catwalk.
amazing catwalk. <laughs> Unfortunately, one of the designers, Augie Boning, who was planning to model their outfit, was unable to come at the last minute. However, they dedicated a lot of time, effort, and skill to their piece, and we still really wanted to showcase it. So here's a recording of their work, and if you'd like to learn more about these two pieces, please see Augie's artist statement in the program. 